tropical paradise along the equatorial belt. Comprising an astounding string of 17,000 plus islands. Bounded by two oceans. Home to abundant sea life. Indonesia is the epicenter of marine biodiversity. Professional dive operators providing international standard gear and services. Supported by a highly experienced dive staff. Endless underwater gems waiting to be discovered. Boasting hundreds of stunning dive sites, catering to divers of all levels. Dive breathtaking drop-offs and explore old shipwrecks and countless variety of macro life.
woke up below the surface, where I learned to face my fears and go with the flow. But it's when I came to appreciate the big and the small, made new friends from all over, and could no longer hide my true colors, that I knew I'd emerged a local. Hello, my dear friends. It's been a while since your last visit. But I want you to know I'm here. Here for you now. And in better days ahead. Things may have slowed in your world. But it's anything but slow here. My reefs team with colorful fish. Schooling hammerheads circle the deep. Playful dolphins roam the shallows. In gentle waves whisper, come back. spending hours dreaming of my underwater forest, of my soaring eagle rays, of my wise giant leatherback turtles, of my playful and friendly lions, of the stars that shine below, and the serenading humpback singing. Just as you are resetting, so am I. Everything is more vivid, more plentiful, brighter. I'll continue to surprise you more than ever before. We're always connecting, you and I. In me, you seek solace. And I promise to heal you and delight you. My creatures are calling. A new adventure is waiting. I'll see you soon.
is a gift that we have shared with the world. But in the stillness of today, our island is asking everyone to give us a moment.
you. Hi, everyone. Welcome to uh, the session on Data Expo Submission Expo. Uh, today, we are featuring Blue Green 101 and also uh, Ocean Odyssey 101 uh, sessions. So uh, today, uh, we have here a, a panel of uh, Singapore Ocean Defenders. Yeah, Singapore Ocean Defenders. Um, that has been uh, working pretty aggressively in our uh, Singapore landscape uh, to address or bring up the topic of um, ocean plastic waste. Uh, so today, let me just briefly uh, introduce you to uh, our panelists. Um, right, so we have here the first uh, in the panel is um, Tom uh, Peacock uh, of from Seven Clean Seas. Tom, you want to give it a wave a little bit so that everybody can see you? Thank you. Uh, the next in line we have is, of course, uh, Matilda De Silva from Ocean Purpose Project. Uh, hi, Matt. Yeah, a bigger green will be fantastic. <laughs> okay, and uh, the next one that we have in mind, uh, that we have in our session today is Mark Cole uh, from TNT Shipping. Um, he's um, also working very aggressively with regards to ocean plastic conundrum. And last but not least is, of course, uh, Paul Foster. Uh, yeah, he's giving a big wave now. And uh, he's also coming in from All Clear, uh, which is his latest uh, social enterprise that uh, he has started off as a compounder. Right, so um, maybe I would let you guys introduce a little bit more about yourself. Uh, perhaps we'll start with Tom. Tom. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Nora. Um, I mean, first of all, thank you for, for having me again. It was great to work with you guys last year. And although things are very, very different with COVID this year, um, the series of video kind of webinars that you guys have pulled off is, is fantastic. So two thumbs up on that. Um, like Nora uh, said, my name is Tom Peacock. I am the founder of Seven Clean Seas. So if you've not heard about Seven Clean Seas, we are a ocean kind of conservation organization. We're based and registered here in Singapore. I've actually lived here with my wife for over seven years now, actually. Time's flying. And we've always kind of been fortunate enough to be able to travel kind of throughout the region. And there was several moments in, in kind of the past where we've really kind of come face to face with the ugly truth around ocean plastic pollution. And we really wanted to find a way to come back to Singapore, back to home and find a way to kind of reenact that same that same kind of set of emotions in, in people here, hopefully to enable them to kind of look at their own personal consumption habits around plastic pollution and uh, and really help them make make changes. So. We host monthly beach cleanups, usually when there's no COVID. Um, we're not hosting any just yet. But the idea is we get huge amounts of people down. Um, I think our biggest cleanup was over 650 people here in Singapore, which was just mind-blowing. And the idea is we all get stuck in. It's zero waste. We don't produce any kind of um, waste, even trash bags. We use it in cycle. We use it in collection um, bags. And, uh, and and we just have a good, good time, really. Um, we've removed over 50 tons of plastic, uh, not just in Singapore, mainly in Singapore, but also further afield. So we're focusing quite heavily kind of going forward on, on Malaysia and Indonesia, particularly kind of within the surrounding area around Sing Singapore. Um, a big part of the, the plastic pollution that does land on Singapore, and there is a considerable amount, is, is actually not sourced in Singapore, even though we do have our own issues around littering. That's a different subject. And we really wanna to get to the source of the problem. So our idea is if we can get to these locations, build communities uh, like we have done here in Singapore, build infrastructure where appropriate to actually stop this plastic getting into the marine environment, um, that's gonna be the best way to really to really kind of get a handle on, on this issue here looking from a Singapore centric kind of perspective. So if you guys ever want to get involved, uh, they are good fun. Head over to our Facebook or Instagram. You can follow us. Our handle is just seven clean seas. So S E B E N clean seas, get involved. And hopefully when all of this madness has blown over and we're allowed outside of our houses again, 
we can go clean a beach together and uh, and catch up. Thanks, Tom. Um, well, throughout this um, uh, session itself, uh, we do have a picture from um, um, something that Tom have captured in his journey uh, while doing all this beach cleanup, not only in Singapore, but I mean also all across the region. Uh, could we have Carter, would you mind sharing the um, pictures that Tom has shared with us, please? Uh, sure, just let me open up. Tom. One second, I don't think I have Tom's. Oh, yes, seven clean seas. One second, it's coming up. Okay. All righty. This uh -huh. is one of my favorite photos of all time, actually. Um, there's an Orang Lao village um, just south of Singapore, so off the south coast of, of Bintan. Like, believe it or not, there is still Orang Lao living in the region. There are still dugongs down there. Like, this place is so remote, yet it's it's on our doorstep. And we partner with some of the resorts off the coast of East um, East Bintan, uh, Nikoi and, and Chempidek. Um, they're run by a guy called Andrew Dixon, who's just an absolute kind of conservation legend. If you know him, you'll agree. Um, and we go down there, we do a big social project with the with the community and we do a big beach cleanup. And uh, as you can see, we're all having a great time. That was a fantastic weekend. That was really fun. Uh, I think I saw somebody familiar. There you go, Nora. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I participated and this is very fun, I must say. It was well, a, a very interesting experience. It was great. What I've not told you is that I took us all and camped on a desert island, like literally nothing on this island. 30 people, it was amazing. Brought Nora along for the ride. Um, didn't realize there were so many sand flies, so apologies for that. But I think you had a fun time. Oh. It was great. And then knee deep, um, my trashiest picture knee deep in plastic. Um, that skip, to give it some context, is as tall as I am, which isn't very tall, but it's uh, it's pretty tall. It's eight foot wide, it's uh, 18 foot long. So when it's filled, it can hold about 3,000 kilos of plastic, which is it's mind boggling. And that's from two beaches in Singapore. Tom, where is this at actually? This is out towards the uh, Tanamera area. So depending on the time of year, like the, the issues with plastic pollution in Singapore are really kind of um, monsoonal. So there are some times of the year where the East Coast will be super dirty, like crazy dirty. Um, the NEA do a really good job of, of keeping on top of this with their contractors. They're cleaning it up to three times a day and it's still accumulating. We go to a couple of the hidden spots out there that don't get any attention. And, uh, and as you can see, it is, it's horrific, the amount of plastic. And I wish I could tell you like this is, is a special situation, but we can go to this spot almost like every other day and collect this amount of plastic. When the wind's blown in the right direction, um, when the weather's right, so depending on what the rains have been doing, it's, um, it's, it's horrific. There's no other word for it. Um, to me, that is the situation I want people to be um, kind of immersed in. If we can immerse the general public in situations like this, I hope that they become as shocked as I was in the, in the initial phases and, and get on board and go do something. Um, it's great to see like other grassroots initiatives popping up all over the place. There's more and more in Singapore. I know Matilda's been to a few of our events before and uh, I hope she's had fun because uh, they've been, they, they have been hard work. But I mean, this is what we're, this is what we're all about. It's about spreading the passion, getting more people involved. Um, we could have a million people pop up doing this. It wouldn't be enough. So it's uh, we've all got to do our bit and spread spread the love a little bit on that. Tom, so usually for a common um, beach cleanup uh, from Seven Clean Seas, Clean Seas itself, what's usually the the good um, amount of manpower you get basically for setting up? So I mean, we'd average two hundred people. Um, we've been very fortunate to build a good a good following over the years. Um, we try and keep it as fun as possible. We'll keep it kind of lighthearted, not take it too serious. People are coming and giving us 
half of their day on a Saturday morning, you know, they want to, they want to leave feeling like they've achieved something and feel real positive. And, and that's what we're all about. It's not about kind of, and as, as much as we do love having like the hardcore environmentalists on board, um, we want everybody. We, we want absolutely people from all walks of life, people that you wouldn't necessarily ever see at a beach cleanup, because if we can kind of latch onto those individuals who would never go to a usual beach cleanup and we can shock them into action, then that's real measurable change. Um, but yeah, it's, it is great. We've done, we've done some huge ones in the past and I'm sure when COVID is over, they're going to be bigger and better than ever. Well, we do have a, uh, an, uh, a uh, what do you call this, a sharing from one of our audiences. Uh, her name is Tay Tara. She said that, yes, uh, part of Tana Mira catches a lot of rubbish, but uh, she do highlight um, that the Northern Shores, especially within the Simbawang and Coney Island, uh, is pretty awful too. So I think most of us, I mean, for yourself, Tom, I think you did uh, some cleanup over that area as well. So, um how yeah, we, we do spend half the year up on the northern shores. So, uh, again, it comes back to kind of the monsoonal nature of plastic pollution in Singapore. So you'll find between kind of um, October, well, sorry, from kind of, yeah, October till about, about May, the north shores are like crazy dirty. The Yishun area is particularly bad. The Yishun Dam just traps so much. I mean, the whole thing shaped like a, like a trap. So it just gets pushed in and... And washed up but all the way along to Changi Beach it's just it's horrendous what happens is that, that northeast monsoon switches the winds kind of do nothing for a couple of months and then they start pumping um, and it's the southwest monsoon and what we'll find is that the north shore actually becomes quite clean and the southern shore all of a sudden which has been clean really clean for six months becomes super dirty so this is a this is a regular occurring pattern and unfortunately you can predict dirty beaches in Singapore like the weather it just depends on which way the wind is blowing and what time of year it is. Well, thank you, Tom, for the sharing. Um, we'll get back to you in a bit, but let's just uh, move on to Matilda uh, to tell us a little bit more about Ocean Purpose Project. Matilda, over to you. Thank you so much, Nora. Um, I think we've come a pretty long way since uh, Media Corp. Are you able to hear me? Uh, a bit soft, a bit soft. A bit soft. Oh, Kelly's whispering again. How's this one? Is this better? Uh, yes, uh, it's good. All right. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, thank you so much for having me um, as part of this panel. Uh, I mean, to be honest, I think my journey is really, really short compared to you know what you guys have been doing year on year. Um, yeah, I actually um, used to go off and join Tom's uh, beach cleaning escapades, you know, I've always said that like, you know, if you want to do like the big massive beach cleanup, you go look for seven clean seas because you got to skip and everything. I mean, like this guy is like, go big or go home. Um, and it's a fun day out. Um, you know, although it's as you, as you sort of get stuck in and you're on a, a stand up paddle board and you're looking at all that plastic, you will also kind of wonder like, okay, there has to be something more to that. Um, so, I mean, to a lot of people, I think, um, uh, most people would recognize me as maybe being that Singapore Idol person or my corporate friends would be like, okay, um, what's this business about Ocean Purpose Project and why you, uh, why have you kind of gone on for it, gone off the reservation and started a social enterprise? Um, and I think uh, a lot of it has to do with my background. Um, uh, in 2015, I represented Singapore in a dragon boat race in, in Boracay. Um, and we were having a time of our lives paddling. It was fantastic. Um, drinking more than paddling, I think. But, you know, it was, it was a lot of fun. Won a lot of medals. Uh, but I didn't realize that um, just with that weekend of exposure to the polluted water, I mean, none of us realized the water was polluted. Um, it had triggered um, my immune system to collapse. And about 20 dragon boaters were also hospitalized from that race. Um, only much later in 2018 did I realize that this was because of uh, the massive amount of sewage and runoff that was coming off the hotels in Boracay. And all that was going straight into the beaches that we were swimming, paddling, uh, you know, dive instructors were diving off. Um, and, you know, and that just, just jolted me because I personally then understood what was going wrong with me. 
uh, with my health. Um, and it kind of made me think, wait a minute, uh, there are people and we have friends who actually live on those beaches um, for years. Years. That's their livelihood. Their lifeguards. That they uh, they run businesses there. How are they coping with this plus this um, water pollution? Um, and that's something that just it's kind of been bugging me. And even though I went off and did my my um, let's see, is this better? Are you able to hear me better this way? Yeah. So even though I started um, going off and paddling. Um, I realized that, uh, I mean, even at work, I was searching for something with a little bit more purpose. And I think last year when I was at DBS uh, recruiting social enterprises for the DBS Grant Foundation, um, I just really got infected with the energy of people who were just like me in your 30 plus um, who decided that they wanted to, you know, find purpose in their careers, go off and pursue any one of those UNSDGs and just really dedicate their time and effort to it. Um, I mean, every single person on this panel is very interesting, um, comes from a different background. You know, um, I mean... Paul from television and broadcast, Mark um, from shipping, Tom, I think you're finance, right? Um, Nora, you are, um, you know, fashion. And the beauty of this generation is really that, like, you know, our generation kind of went, okay, um, we want to work with purpose. We want to do something different with our lives. And that's where Ocean Purpose Project was born. In fact, to be honest, um, although we started last year, we've only um, really incorporated the company on the 3rd of March. So what a time to start. <laughs> Okay. Um, but, you know, last year was when we really just sort of um, began our first project, which was in Plastic to Fuel. So, Carter, if I could trouble you to just um, push that uh, image up on the screen. Sure. One second. So, um, you know, one of the things that I was struggling with was, um, you know, thinking to myself, wait a minute, am I just going to start an yet another social enterprise um, you know, what is a way that we could try and solution engineer around the problem? So um, this is an interesting slide because this uh, doesn't talk about Singapore, but it's talking about an island called Medan, which is located in Sumbawa in Indonesia. And um, this island is inundated with about three, two to three meters of plastic. Um, and what's interesting is a girl that I met, um, in fact, at some of the seven clean seas beach cleanups, some of the trash hero beach cleanups, her name is Lisa Jones. She's a Pilates teacher. The two of us, um, kind of hit all the beach cleanups, um, you know, kind of like a CrossFit thing. We were like, oh yeah, look at, look at this guy. They're only picking up one bag. We're going to hit 10 bags, you know? Um, and we just kind of came to this agreement where there has to be something that we can do with this plastic. Uh, there has to be something circular that we could do with it. So um, long story short, uh, last year was really about working together with her and setting up the social enterprise of the island called Medang for Change and driving the plastic to fuel project, which if you can see, um, we've got one of the lovely um, Islander kids, um, you know, who's sitting on a, uh, his own couch of, of uh, water bottles. Um, the villagers had been inundated with this plastic and, you know, and they had kind of put the word out looking for um, someone who, will, who would just be able to offer them a solution. And, you know, to be honest, in that year of journey in trying to build a plastic to fuel machine, I mean, I'm a social media person. Lisa's a Pilates teacher. We ain't got no business working on petrochem engineering stuff, I'm going to tell you that. But um, the truth is, with just a lot of research, working with partners, partnering with researchers, you know, um, we ideated in January. The machine was delivered in June. And the beautiful part about this, this picture that you see with the boy, um, you know, the villagers always told us that uh, we believe that you guys are going to, you know, build this machine. We believe that this is going to be set up, even though we didn't really believe in it ourselves. We were like, oh, my God, there's a lot of pressure here. Um, and they would do these things where they were also trying to recycle and, and reuse some of these items. 
And finally, um, the machine actually is able to, it is working currently. It took about six months um, for the test to be up, but uh, currently what you see on the uh, top uh, corner of the picture is um, what happens when the plastic is put through the machine. It gets uh, turned into all of these different kinds of fuel. You, on the extreme right, you have um, um, that ch uh, char, the like kind of like a black tar. And then you also are able to extract about um, jet fuel grade kerosene from this process. So, um, I mean, there's a lot of issues with plastic to fuel that need to be sorted out. Primarily among them are um, hydrocarbons and, you know, and trying to sequester all of these gases. But I think um, what this experiment kind of showed us was that through collaboration with other social enterprises, with researchers, and also with industry partners, especially people in the petrochem industry, um, you know, in a year, we were able to solve part of a problem for an island that nobody really cared about, um, was stuck in the boondocks. Um, and this is really where, um, you know, that proof of concept, they were the first to sort of put their hands up and say, sure, you know, we'll test this out with you. And this is something Thing that we want to do in Singapore. Um, so that's what Ocean Purpose Project is working on. Um, and I think, you know, the greater spirit of this and what um, today's uh, webinar is about really is about talking to all of the social enterprises and, you know, the amazing work that's already being done in Singapore um, to celebrate, um, you know, and kind of also be able to pull all of those resources together and just like, you know, kind of attack this problem. I mean, you know, Singaporeans, right? Like, you know, they kind of like think about something and then they'll like, you know, roll it in the head. And then after that, they were like, all right, this is how we strategize. We're going to do this, this, this. I'm going to grab you. Paul, and I'm going to put Tom on this and then Mark's going to go out on the boat. You know, literally, we're just naturally geared in this way to, to be efficient and start thinking of things. So, yeah, that's kind of what Ocean Purpose Project is all about and where we want to go with that. Long story, right, Nora? <laughs> oh, no, long story. La. Yeah, we speak English now. La. Okay. Yes. <laughs> anyway, like uh, like what you said, it's true. Like um, to, to actually um, manage this uh, ocean plastic uh, uh, pollution or even the waste uh, management with regards to single-use plastic has to be not for a, a collaborative point, uh, work, not only in Asia, but of course all across the world as well. Um, so, um, thank you for sharing, uh, but we'll catch back to you a little bit uh, later, and uh, let's move on to Mark. Mark, please tell us more. Hey, Nora, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say thanks to everyone uh, on the call, uh, ADEX for the invitation, Matilda for the recommendation, and of course, it's great to catch up again with Paul and Tom, uh, and of course, I want to thank all the uh, members of the audience right now taking time out uh, to listen to all of us. So uh, I, my name is Mark. I work for a company called Tian San Shipping. Uh, we are a local company in Singapore, and we are, have been very lucky that for the past 20 or so years, we've been contracted by the Singapore government to clean up the waters around Singapore. Uh, we've been doing it for a while, and I think I share the sentiments uh, where a lot of the panelists have said there's actually a lot of water pollution in Singapore and a lot of trash does come in. Most of the trash does not originate from Singapore, it originates from all around Southeast Asia and it finds its way to us. Uh, like Tom said, you know, a few months out of the year, it's dirty up north and sometimes it's dirty uh, in the south of Singapore. But to give you an idea, you know, we literally face and I would, I would say, describe it like this, never ending waves of plastic pollution coming into Singapore. Now, we have a limited fleet that we can work with. And even with this limited fleet, we clear about 5,000 cubic meters of waste a year, of which about 50% is plastic. And this number has been going up. It used to be a bit less plastic. Now that number has been going up. And that in terms of weight, is about anywhere between 1,000 to 1,200 tons of plastic waste that we clean up from our waters. This is not including the stuff that Tom cleans up that makes it to the beaches and makes it everywhere else. This is what we can intercept before it gets to our shores. 
Uh, and you know, just to give a perspective, that is about one entire uh, Olympic size swimming pool of waste uh, alone. So uh, uh, that's uh, if Carter, if you can just pull up like a, a photo of some of the, of what it looks like in Singapore, uh, in the Singapore waters all the time. I think I just want to go to the uh, photo in the top right. Uh, what you see there, you know, a lot of people, when they see this picture, they think this is uh, somewhere else. But no, that's in Singapore. Um, Paul and Tom, you guys have been there. Uh, you know where that is. That's, that's near the Woodlands checkpoint up north. And this will be during the uh, southwest monsoon season. So it's like that every day. In fact, this picture is it's not a bad day. It's actually maybe four or five times that amount. So besides receiving things like that, I also wanted to go to the picture just below that. You can see like a long line of blue bins. So we also pick up things like this that's, that are floating in the waters around Singapore. And these are actually from, I believe they are mussel or oyster farms uh, in Malaysia. And during storms and such, they just break off and they, and they just come into our waters. Of course, below that, uh, something else we pick up is a kelong. Uh, literally, the kelong got dislodged somewhere and it just came into our waters. And then when we saw it, we're like, oh, wow, we have to clear this up. So that it was, it was actually quite large and I don't have a picture there, but when you look inside, it was actually a full structure. They had, they had equipment and machinery and everything inside. And these are ty the types of things that we have to deal with. So what you can tell from this is a lot of this is all man-made. You know, most of the trash we pick up is man-made. Of course, there's, uh, of course, natural debris. We try to not uh, deal with a lot of that. Um, but a lot of the pollution is caused by us, and it's, uh, it's, we really need to drive behavioral change uh, around the world. Now, I think on that note, you know, we started noticing a few years ago, we, because we've been doing this for over 20 years, we have the vessels, the technology, we've been advancing it for many years. And for the longest time, we thought we were the only ones, uh, uh, no one was interested really. We thought no one was interested, and we thought, oh, every country has some version of us. But in recent years, we kind of noticed that, wait, wait a minute, actually, there's a lot more attention on it. And a lot of countries did not have uh, time to build up uh, what we have been able to do in Singapore. So we started to say, hey, let's go around Southeast Asia. So we went to different countries. We checked out what everyone was doing. And we said, look, uh, some countries are good. Some countries fall short. And it wasn't just in Southeast Asia. It was around the world. And then, uh, you know, I sat down with Paul one day, and then we were talking about it. And, you know, out of the blue, we were just like, look, let's make, since we already have the know-how, let's actually make it happen. Let's bring it out there. Let's start uh, an initiative. And we just started all clear. And of course, on that journey, we've been very lucky to meet Tom, uh, meet Matilda, and, you know, Nora now is great to meet uh, the team at ADEX as well. And I think uh, on that note, you know, this is something we really want to push out there to make it available to everyone. So what we can do in Singapore, we can do anywhere. And if anyone wants to take part, we are more than happy to work with anybody. Uh, if you want to come out, we can bring you out on our boats anytime. Uh, we can do a cleanup uh, and we can work with, with, work with Tom. Awesome. <laughs> I see some people putting their hands up there. So we should, we should do it. We should all work together for that. So on that note, actually, Nora, I can, I can hand it back to you. Well, um, Mark, I actually have a question for you. Oh, awesome. Okay. Um, so, what actually goes on uh, when the volunteers uh, goes on board of your boat, and uh, how does how's the process of uh, this this beach cleanup happen actually? Ah, so on our side, sorry, I did not clarify that earlier. We actually don't do beach cleanup. Uh, we clean up the coastline. So bef before the waste gets onto uh, the beaches, we try to hit it there. Um, now, what we do is we actually do this for the Singapore government. All right. However, we notice that a lot of people are very interested in it. So for us, we just have vessels. You can come on board. We have equipment uh, to scoop up uh, the waste. Uh, also, we try in sometimes to trap the waste. Of course, finding the waste is another thing, but our team uh, knows where that is. So it's as simple as it sounds as either a boat, uh, depending on the size. Uh, you can just jump on and then uh, do uh, waste cleanup. I think Tom, we also discussed, Tom and Paul, I've, I've been discussing with Tom and Paul, like if you look at the smaller vessel here, um, I think, you know, uh, for people, uh, PPCDL, uh, 
for the guys in Singapore doing boating, you know what that is. That's just the, the pleasure craft license. Uh, you should be able to just jump on board one of these and actually go out and uh, do a cleanup uh, as well. Uh, now, the one on the on the left, which uh, Carter is circling, this one is actually more uh, aligned with an industrial scale cleanup. So we will not be able to put uh, people on board this vessel, uh, but we have other vessels um, that people can just jump on board. So the small blue one, if you have a license, you can actually jump on board and start doing cleanups. Uh, for the people without a license, we have different vessels. Unfortunately, they're not pictured here, uh, which we can uh, get uh, people on and then we can go out and, uh, and do some cleanups. Hope that answers the question. Well, that leads to another question. Mark. Mark. Uh, uh, yes, yes. Can I just ask you, so all these vessels, are they uh, purely uh, fully automated or it has to be managed by someone? Uh, so the vessels in Singapore now, they are, the machinery is fully automated, but the navigation still needs to be uh, done by someone who is licensed to uh, 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 navigate a vessel in Singapore. So it's just like a driver's license. If you don't have a driver's license, you're not allowed to operate it but you can be a passenger doing uh, work on it. Okay, thank you, Mark. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, we'll come back to you. I'm sure that's Very welcome. a question. Uh, I, I do have a lot of questions, actually. I'm pretty curious about uh, your nature of business, actually, uh, with regards to uh, plastic cleanup. Um, right, so next, shall we go to Paul Foster? Uh, Paul? Uh, perhaps you could tell us a little bit more about your journey towards um, wanting to clean plastic or uh, ocean plastic. How did it, how did you get into that uh, landscape altogether? And also, um, tell us more about all clear. There you go. Thanks, Nora. Can you hear me? Yep. Wonderful. Oh, clear. Thank you. Um, yeah, so yeah, pleasure to, to, to be here with everyone. This is an outstanding panel. Uh, I think everyone has already um, kind of said their piece and, and it is just so wonderful to see the passion just from everyone that's here. And as Mark uh, said earlier, you know, I, I've known Mark for quite a long time now. Uh, we're, we're, we're old friends that, that go back, back in the day. And, you know, in in late 2018, he literally came up to me and he just said, uh, you know, I'd like to kind of be a little bit more corporate responsible and go out and do a little bit more from TSS um, and, and, and really fix this problem, uh, this global crisis. And I always remember it was uh, National Day 2018. We had this chat together and... Uh, and, you know, that's how All Clear was born. It was born from that simple conversation of, I have the um, technical expertise and experience on the industrial operation level. You have the volunteer and, and social responsible um, kind of, you know, passion. Can we get together and partner up on this? And it was a, it was a no brainer. Um, I've always been a, 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 someone that's fighting for, for, you know, nature and the environment. And when Mark offered me this, this partnership, I was like, wow, finally, because I was just thinking to myself, I want to get a cause that, that I've started, that I've actually cultivated from the ground up and be a part of that instead of not, you know, instead of just helping another organization or another a group of people that are doing it. As much as I still do that and I help to volunteer and I help to uh, advocate for them, I thought I really wanted something of a personal uh, mission for myself. Um, so it was just perfect timing because also I did notice that that our plastic pollution in, in our oceans was just terrible. The last few years, we've been seeing more and more of that. Um, so it's a very natural, organic transition. Um, you know, like like it just fell from the sky that, that, that Mark wanted to offer me this partnership and it was just uh, um, something that we had to do. As, as Tom is just saying, though, with all this craziness going on at the moment as well for 2020, it's been a little bit difficult to get things off the ground a little bit more. Um, so operations that we were looking at doing regionally have um, obviously been put on hold for the moment. Um, but, you know, at least from TSS standpoint, um, 
they're still cleaning every day. They still, they're still doing it um, in Singapore, uh, as, as Mark's already shown, and as Tom's already shown, um, that what we get around um, in our waters and eventually on our beaches. So that's still happening, um, but we, we, we do want to still take all clear and, and, and move it out into the, into the region, into the international global space, because again, this is a global crisis. Uh, it's a problem that starts with us, but eventually it gets into nature and it, it causes a lot of issues. And eventually it ends with us because it all breaks down to microplastics. And as long as you're eating seafood, <laughs> you're, you're basically consuming some sort of a plastic um, at some point. So, you know, this was just something that we, we, we had to do. Um, and, and All Clear was something that we, we came up with uh, from a lot of names that we asked some people to, to kind of give us uh, at our soft launch event that we did last year. And uh, this was one of the names that came out and it kind of worked with uh, the message that we wanted to go ahead with, you know, an, an all clear future. We want to work together to, to, to clean up uh, ocean pollution, in particular plastics, um, and, and have an all clear future. So, yeah, we had a, we had a couple of pictures, I think, sent through as well, um, Carter. I don't know if, if you've got those uh, over there with you, but um, it's the same thing. So that's exactly me on the left on one of the uh, TSS uh, smaller uh, boats. So not the big, not the big boat, the medium ones. This is a medium one. So it allows us to get a little bit closer to, to the corner there. And I mean, if you didn't know that I was on the water right now, you, you could be mistaken that just trash on land. And this again was what Mark was telling me. Uh, this was not a bad day. <laughs> this was, this was, you know, for better lack of the word, a better day. And uh, it's just full of trash. Again, as everyone has spoken before me, it all depends on the wind. It all depends on the tide. It all depends on the, on the moon soon, the time of the year. Um, most, if not all of this trash is not even from Singapore. Uh, we, won't, we, won't, we won't name any <laughs> names here, but you know that, that's just in the water and it's naturally coming, coming to, to, to our side. And again, on the right, when we look at how much we collect, and this would be a, a, a slightly bigger uh, skip than the one that Tom was in, but it's still the same kind of, of, of size where you're looking at anywhere between two to four or five tons of, of, of trash that you can collect and fill those, those bins with. And, you know, you can fill one of those bins depending on how much trash there is in a day or in a couple of days or in three days. And that's happening every day, every single day uh, across multiple locations. Um, the boats and the manpower are going out and cleaning this much trash. And you can see a whole bunch of stuff there. I mean, you've got organic waste, you've got, you've got styrofoam, uh, you've got metal, but the majority of that trash is plastic. Um, and the bad thing with plastic really is it takes 400 years to break down. It isn't recyclable if it is contaminated for too long in, in, in salt water in particular. So me and Mark have been discussing how to really fix this problem. And um, it is going to the source. I think Tom mentioned that earlier as well and Matilda as well. And actually going out to the communities and, and going upriver and cleaning it upriver before it gets to the ocean or even going to the communities and providing them uh, an incentive to recycle, to collect the waste before you're even throwing it into the water. And whether or not we can create a circular economy to buy that waste back off them to then make fuel, which I think is absolutely fantastic, Matilda. I think that's wonderful what you guys are doing over there. You said you can make a uh, jet quality kerosene fuel there. I think uh, SIA might be interested in buying some of that fuel off you at the moment. If you can sell it for them to a cheap, cheap, I think uh, they might Mia be interested. Go. Mia. <laughs> I'll find a contact for you at SQ. We'll get that going. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's things like that. It's creating the multiple levels here where we as, as passionate volunteers can go out and do this job. But at the same time, it's, it's a problem we need to stop, stop from the source. So before it gets into the water, 
um, educating the communities out there who, and you know, it's not it's not their fault. Uh, we, we always say that most of the communities that are basically adding to this problem, they don't have clean water. They don't have a clean water source. They can't drink water out of their taps like we can in Singapore. So in Singapore, I mean, I don't think anyone should be buying bottled water, period. Bottled water and plastic should not be bought in Singapore. When you can turn on your tap right here and drink the water straight from the source. But in communities, in um, you know, especially in Indonesia and, and, and other parts of the world, they don't have that luxury. So we understand that it's, it's, it's a convoluting issue um, and we need to go in and we need to help uh, these communities, um, whether we can instill clean water source systems for them or whether if they do purchase you know, water in, in bottles that they reuse the plastic bottles or at least recycle them. Um, we can make fuel from them if we can buy them from the tonnage and recycle them ourselves. I mean, there's so many different ways um, the model can work, but it is getting getting back to to the source and trying to sort out the issues there. And, uh, you know, in society, in, in other countries that are a little bit more modern and have luxury to curb our single-use plastics and, um, and stop that, actually, to really, really limit that. And, and I know it's difficult with convenience, but um, we've got to start somewhere. We, we all have to lead by example and do our part. It's true. It's true what you say, um, Paul. Um, like, for example, the Singapore government's approach is not to ban single-use plastic, but they're more of encouraging or uh, leveraging uh, towards the concept of education um, and also to instill um, some kind of... Um, uh, consumer uh, perspective on how we go about buying or purchasing anything, basically. So as uh, we're looking at the pictures just now that you actually shared with us, we are, Singapore uh, is a country of convenience, I must say. So um, hence, we can see a lot of single-use plastic um, that is found within that certain area. Uh, but I must, I must also highlight that we did have... Uh, a discussion uh, a couple of weeks ago with um, the uh, with the this uh, cave diver in Indonesia. So uh, in Indonesia itself, they are facing this kind of uh, conundrum as well, where um, a lot of the um, uh, the native livelihood it's uh, depending depend a lot on the rivers. So for example, they do uh, washing, cleaning up, uh, cooking, etc. So all these um, statutes uh, from detergents or even like uh, from food as well are being washed into the caves and you can see within the uh, stalactites and stalagmites in the cave itself an entrapment of such, um, uh, what do you call this, packaging um, as well. Um, so, you know, like usually for beach cleanup, they would like to actually study what is in uh, what, what is being pushed uh, in terms of uh, plastic-wise to our areas. So based on um, Indonesia perspective, on the cave diver, he noticed a lot of um, FMC, FMCG uh, yes. packaging. But yes. for us in Singapore, we notice a lot of PET bottles. So um, I don't know, maybe what else, what else interesting that you, know, you, you notice during your cleanup with Mark and also, Tom, you can jump in and just uh, join us. Matt, also, uh, Paul, maybe you want to start up. Start off. Yeah, there. yeah, that's that's interesting. So, I mean, again, depending on where you are and and what's you know being used, it's all sorts of different kind of trash that we get. Um, I always say there's three levels. So you've got you've got us as a society. I think we do need to change consumer behavior, especially in countries where we can control. Um, single-use plastics. Uh, you know, you, we, we have reusable bottles we can fill up with, with water. Uh, you don't have to use plastic bags. You can use reusable, reusable bags when, whenever you need to um, do your shopping. Um, your containers as well, you know, reusable containers when you go get your food. Yeah, Kara, love your bottle right there, brother. Um, there's so many ways we can do it. But also, like you said, the next level is, is corporate. Corporate and industry. I mean, it's also up to them to decide how much they, how much, how much greener do they want to be? 
I know they have a bottom dollar. I know they have shareholders to, you know, adhere to. I know everyone wants to make a profit, but there are ways that, uh, you know, we can be better. Um, and on a corporate level, there are some companies out there who are trying to do better. So, you know, it's that level. And then obviously, lastly, is, is, is governance. Governments have to start giving maybe tax breaks to the corporates if they start to go a little bit more green and a little bit more sustainable. They have to start providing some sort of incentives for, for society as well, for consumers perhaps, or just literally kick in laws to say we, we do have to be better. And we do have to do better. But um, yeah, you're right. We see all sorts of trash. Uh, me and Mark have spoken to, you know, Procter and & Gamble and, and a few of the, the big people out there. Um, and they say the same things. They, they, they've been looking at ideas of how they could stop their little sachets sach, of, of shampoo and soap being, uh, you know, thrown out into our waters. And um, I think it does come back down to, uh, to the source. Uh, again, going out and, and just working with communities and, and education and just letting everyone know that there's, there's an alternative to just throwing your trash into, into your rivers, which end up in the Paul and Mark, I actually want to ask you something about, so those pictures that we were seeing, right? There's, it seems as if, okay, so there's a lot of stuff that's coming off Kelongs that are, or things that are dislodged during storms. Um, that's the big ticket items. Um, you know, like, so in terms of what washes on our shores, um, is, this a, is this a question of, let's say these big ticket items are, coming off Kelongs or aquaculture farms that uh, are just off Singapore. Uh, and then the mid-range to smaller range would be your uh, single-use plastic. Um, one thing that um, a lot of people when you know tell me when we do the East Coast cleanups, um, you know, is that there's a lot of Dasani cups or like, you know, these little water cups. And I was like, okay, where are these things coming from? And how come they're here? But in, in the north, uh, northern area around Pasir Ris, I don't see that much of that. And then I realized when I started taking ferries to Bintan or to Batam that that's what they give you when, you know, you have a drink of water uh, on the ferry. So, you know, I think, um, do you kind of notice that there's these links between like behavior and like, you know, what's washing up. And I can, I can jump on that one. So, I mean, it kind of ties back to the monsoonal effects of, of when this plastic is washing up. Um, what you'll find is that depending on the monsoon, the plastic actually has different personalities. People laugh mm -hmm. at me when I say this, but it is, it's after doing this for long enough, you'll realize that the different beaches and the different types of years, the plastic landing on that beach has a personality. Now, whether that is going to be um, in kind of the southwest monsoon on the southern shore when you've got mass amounts of post-consumer plastics. So you've got your drinks bottles, but you've got your Dasanis, you've got your, um, you've got your coffee plastic cups that are coming from Japan. You've got things coming from China and, and Vietnam and Philippines. All sorts of kind of things washing up, but the vast majority of it is post-consumer. Um, the Dasani and the little drink spots, pots, I mean, if you look at the vast, vast majority of them, they're actually Batam um, sourced. So you can see even on the, on like the, the normal PET bottles, a lot of the water PET bottles are coming from Batam. Now, what's interesting is that a lot of the, the other drinks, PET bottles or HEP bottles, whether that's kind of um, just, just juice or soda or coffee, seems to be coming from further afield, much further afield. And that, that kind of goes to show that it's been there for a long time. Now you flip that and you go up to the northeast monsoon, you go up to the north shore, and that plastic is on the beach is much more post-industrial. So you think you've not just got the Kelongs off our shore. and a, 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 Quite a bit is Kelong kind of um, boys. We get a lot of boys that is obviously coming off Kelongs or all the ships going working within that region. But just look over on the other side of Johor, it's all industrialized. And you yeah. look at all, all the plastic that's coming in, it's coming from there. Now, there was one particular day where the uh, the North Shore was absolutely littered with little cocoa chocolate sachets, like millions of them. And we were looking at them and it was bizarre because the date of production was the day we were picking them up. So something was fishy here. And we did a little bit of research and we actually found its manufacture to be up a river in Johor. And I mean, it's either the world's biggest coincidence that they all fell into that river or they'd been illegally dumped. And it comes back to, again, looking at kind of the sources. Post-industrial is always going to be kind of more airing on the illegal side. 
and then your post-consumer stuff is going to be more people kind of not throwing it in the rivers because people don't like usually throw plastic in a river i mean there's places in kind of indonesia where they throw diapers in rivers and that's because they have a belief that their kid's going to get sick if they don't do that and a big part of some uh, kind of organizations out there is working with mothers to try and explain to them that that's not the case you don't have to throw it in the river but usually it's coming from land-based activities so we're talking about mismanaged municipal waste things going to landfills but the landfills not being managed properly things not even making it to landfills being burnt in piles in the gardens on a daily basis and bintan batam i mean you don't have to go very far as soon as the sun starts to set the plumes start to appear in everybody's house if there's a wind if there's a if there's a rain that's going straight into the local water source that's going to end up in into the um, in the environment um, i don't think we can blame these people whatsoever paul's absolutely right um, a lot of the case you know they've developed they've come a long way in a very short amount of time and they've not had the infrastructure spending from their centralized governments so if you really look at the issue the, the reason the west has much and singapore have been developed and uh, has really low levels of, of kind of plastic pollution is because the infrastructure was invested in i mean are we using less plastic no we're not actually we're probably using more to be fair but it's not ending up in the natural environment and it comes down to infrastructure and this really needs to be where the pivotal kind of turn moving forward kind of looks at and i know um um nora mentioned kind of some of these funds that are becoming available for for kind of ocean purposes ocean cleanup purposes they're all looking to fund waste management they've, they've got really no interest in doing anything offshore cleanup onshore cleanup um, prevention they're going straight to the source and that is very 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 large municipal uh, waste collection and recycling investments and i'm talking tens of millions of us dollars and and that's where the money needs to flow and it's great to see that that's happening so hopefully over time things do start to change but it's it's going to be a long time we have to just try and convince these people and these communities that it's worth the extra effort for them because it's no extra effort for us right we just throw it in the bin and it's managed fine but it's an extra effort for them and that's not fair for them and then you also mentioned about the little the little sachets as well now i know i've spoken to pretty much all the big fmcg companies and and all the ones that produce this this is the bane of their life because they've created a market a competitive market where the people can only afford to buy small amounts of product in one go so they have to use these small packagings and this anything under like a two, two inch by two inch flexible packaging, even if it was made from recyclable material is unrecyclable. So they're, they're making an unrecyclable uh, product and they're putting it into a location where they know it doesn't have waste management. Now, a certain part of this also, we have to flip it back around at them and go, well, guys, what the hell are you doing? You know, you know, this is going to happen. It doesn't take a genius to put two and two together. Now, you may be trying to find a solution for this, but realistically, if we're being honest, you don't want to act on this today because the first mover is going to lose market share. And a lot of this is actually going to come to internal politics around business strategy. Um, and it, it is super complex. And that's when I think governments can set it, step in. Um, Singapore government is actually um, doing some really exciting things. Um, the, the Singapore Chemical Industry Association um, is working. They brought me in actually as well on the, on the sounding as a sounding partner, which is great to work directly with the government on their extended producer responsibility strategies. So in two years, we should be having the buyback systems come in come into play. Now that's not going to be a, a big fix. Um, it will take care of a lot of the PET bottles and make sure that they end up going and getting kind of um, recycled. But the big changes will come in 2025 when there's going to be like full rollout of EPR strategies which is gonna physically tax companies for putting plastic into the market. And that money will go back into the collection, distribution, and, uh, and sourcing of these plastics. So these kind of top-down EPR yeah. strategies are super important if we wanna to get, get, to, get to kind of the, the medium place, which is people doing their bit, but governments and corporates also doing their bit. You know, Tom, I just wanna jump in on that as well. Uh, one of the things uh, I do, I, look, I do it, Hearing what you say about uh, the cleanup details and all that and what we get uh, around Singapore, you know, I think not many people actually know those details. So when you were saying that, I was just nodding my head the whole time. Like, yeah, that's exactly uh, uh, what we pick up as well. Um, but I, I really want to touch on one of the things you mentioned, 
and Paul mentioned and Nora brought up was the cultural aspect. Um, yes, I think in Southeast Asia, uh, we have advanced so fast, especially in, in a lot of the countries around Singapore, that uh, you know the behavior has changed so quickly. Culture locally in all these places have changed so quickly, and they've not been able to keep up with all these changes. And a, a lot of times the issue becomes a, a sanitation issue. Uh, yes, we expect governments to take part, uh, but some of them haven't even seen it as a problem yet. Um, I, you know, I just want to share a little uh, uh, thing about Bali, something we've, we found out in Bali. So Bali, you know, they used to have a lot of paddy fields. And in these paddies, they were all privately owned or owned by villagers. And there used to be like a guy in each village that would control the waste uh, coming through the rivers because you needed clean water to grow your, 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 your rice. And as it developed and property developers just kept taking over and everything became, you know, industrialized hotels and everything, all of these guys that used to take care of all the waste just disappeared. And after, and as they just left the, you know, the rivers just got more and more polluted. And so culturally, uh, you know, in their governance system, there was a, there was a cultural control and that never made it towards the new type of governance. So the uh, government in some ways never took care of it, except for maybe the bigger rivers. But then when you don't take care of all the small streams, it comes in as well. Uh, I agree with you, it's not their fault because some of these changes happen so fast and it's, it's, a, it's a result of economic growth. Uh, but we still have time to change. And I think we still have time to change because in a lot of these places where a lot of it is coming out, the change only happened in this generation. And it wasn't just too long ago where I think even in Singapore, we were, when I, I remember growing up, we were using not that much plastic and we were using a lot of reusable things. So I do think there is a very good opportunity to move back. Uh, and it, it really is a change of behavior and mindset. Uh, I hope that's something we can, we can actually uh, work towards, especially with education of our youth. I totally agree with you, Mark, about them. Um, and I love that story that you told us about Bali and like, you know, how um, traditionally there were actually these gatekeepers of waste. And, you know, I think in terms of digging into Southeast Asian behavior around plastic is really what's also going to shift what um, solutions arise from that. So in Singapore, I always say in every Singaporean household, there's a, there's a temple to a god, right? And that's the god of convenience. You know, um, don't touch my bubble tea and the rest of it. But I think, you know, like um, as as we sort of start to make it cool for you to bring your own reusable, um, you know, thing to the bubble tea shop, to have your little uh, straw, to, to do all of these things. And it just, you know, for me, I love to just have my kopi at the kopi tiam out of the glass and the cup. And, you know, uh, I think those kinds of things and celebrating behavior and tradition and what we used to do and how we used to be is probably what's also going to be some of the key behavioral things that help us to then, you know, shift things industry wise and like, you know, um, in a mass behavior wise as well. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think, I think uh, I need Paul to remind me of this statistic. I think Paul, a few years ago, uh, there was this uh, plasticophobia uh, exhibition and what these guys did was they just went to, I think, uh, 10 to 15 hawker centers, and they just, in one lunchtime, they collected the plastic cups that were left on the table. And Paul, I, I can't remember the amount of plastic cups they collected. Uh, I, do, you, do you remember that amount? I think it was some number like 20,000 plastic cups over lunch. Yeah, something like this. 20, yeah, 20,000 over a day from like 18, 18 hawker centers. Okay. Yeah. And that's, and I, I think that's a crazy thing. It's like, that's how much we actually consume in Singapore without even thinking about it. Uh, and it wasn't so long ago where they, where the, where the, where at the hawker centers they used to actually collect their own cups back and wash it, and then yeah. give you another one. That was, yeah. that was only a few years ago. Exactly. It's just about like rethinking all of the things that we used to do. I mean, I've seen in Thailand where they have like these stations with hot water where you just dip your your cups and bowls and and spoons and everything in the hot water and then. You know, you do it yourself and then off you go and you buy, you know, whatever you want at the shops. Can be done. It can be. It can be. A lot of us grew up without <laughs> so much single-use plastic. Well, um, 
guess what? We're almost uh, at the end. we're actually at the end of this presentation session. So to be honest, to to actually talk about from um, uh, what do you call this social behavior to circular economy to waste management, recycling process. I think the the conversation is endless. To be honest, um, so I just want to. Um, what do you call this? Round everything up just to share a little bit about um, what uh, ADEX is all about. Not only just, we're not only just a diving show, yeah? But there's more to us actually. Um, Kato, do you mind if you can show us uh, a little bit on the, uh, the Big Blue Book video, please? Right, then this is us. <laughs> right, so just uh, to tell us, to, to just share with everyone that uh, we're also a publication house uh, who's uh, focusing a lot on um, uh, sustainable issues. Uh, so we have three titles, one is Asian Diver, uh, and this is our big blue book collection that focusing a lot on plastic itself. So uh, we're one of the few um, that actually covered um, the 11 rivers uh, that is the most polluted in Asia. And uh, we call them the dark waters of Asia, basically. Uh, so these are the facts and information that we have garnered so far. Tom, I know you have seen this magazine, but this is the latest one, uh, which has a whole lot more information uh, with regards to some of the countries that has been acting on uh, to again single use plastic, uh, and then also we do focus on the ocean plastic as well. Um, also, right, so this one is talking about countries, and uh, 127 countries have basically administered uh, to be um, to work against or to work on uh, the single use plastic itself. So, um, so these are just a couple of them, and um, I don't know some of the countries. I, I I think that most of us don't even know that they are working pretty aggressively uh, on this situation, uh, and what are the kind of initiatives that they do on their own um, state level as well. Um, yeah. So, uh, just bear with me a little bit while we breeze through all of this uh, information uh, and also initiative that has been done by this um, fantastic uh, countries from all across the world uh, and what is it that they have done in terms of banning, in terms of what kind of plastic do they ban, um, um, in terms of single-use plastic and like for example in Taiwan they actually created um, an out uh, from all this collection they turn it back to art. So these are just some of the um, highlights that we would like to feature. And I, I'm sure you've seen some of the pictures as well. Nora, how do we get this magazine? I will let you know. I'll, I'll direct uh, PM you and also I'll leave a message onto uh, the Facebook itself. Um, and um, I think... Um, Yep, bear me, it's quite a lot because our, our, the world is actually working pretty hard with regards to this uh, ocean plastic conundrum. Nora, how long did it take for you guys to put this together? How much of research time actually went into this? Oh, Matt. Uh, we did it within a couple of weeks, but of course we do have uh, great uh, connections and contacts um, uh, within our own community itself. And uh, as divers, as you might have known that uh, divers are the first, um, what do you call this, uh, people to actually see what actually is happening in the ocean. Um, I'm sure some of us are divers as well, like Tom, you're a recreational diver. Uh, Matilda, we'll get you diving soon. Double, babe. Swimming <laughs> also uh, susa, I mean, I can make I can make a dive documentary. That's what I can do. Just ain't gonna go in the water. So Paul, I'm sure you're a diver. <laughs> if not, if not wrong. 
Uh, I was supposed to get my license last year, but I missed the boat. And uh, this year, I was supposed to do it. I didn't miss the boat, literally. I'm just uh, <laughs> not, not, not literally missed the boat, but uh, uh, my filming schedule <laughs> prevented me from doing my lessons last year. But I've been, I've been planning it for a long time, and I was hoping to get it done this year. But let's see, 2020 is uh, yeah. might be a bit of a write-off. <laughs> you, will, you will get there, definitely, Mark. Definitely, definitely. I have my open water, but I haven't been diving in a while. Okay. So we, will all go, we will all go together. <laughs> yeah, sponsor, your license. Uh, you sponsor, I'll do the I'll do the buddy. No problem. <laughs> okay, that one I need to talk to certain people. <laughs> okay, so um just to um round everything up, the next session would be uh Carter, what's our next one? Our next one will be Passion make possible. Yes. So um, this session would be, please stay, people. Uh, next session will be um, our ocean uh, marine scientists from Singapore. They are coming uh, together just to share with us a little bit more um, of their latest uh, research. And from that research itself, how it has progressed and create certain milestone to make where Singapore is with regards to marine science. Um, so uh, we do have uh, the likes of Dr. Karin Toon from, uh, well, we, we most probably known her from uh, NPARCS, uh, the lady behind NPARCS for uh, marine biology uh, and environment branch. Uh, we do have Dr. Zihan Jaffa. So Dr. Zihan actually will be, is one of the uh, scientists that actually categorize um, a fish library based on fish DNA from the Singapore waters. Uh, Dr. Jani Tanzil, I think most of us know her. She's a fantastic Yani. Uh, from, uh, um, what do you call this? St. John Island National Marine Laboratory. Uh, the next one, we have Dr. Ao Yan Xiang. She is the lady when you want to talk about seagrass. And also our fantastic moderator, Sam, uh, is from... Uh, NUS, uh, the research, uh, research assistant to Tropical Marine Science Institute and also the co-founder of Our Singapore Reef. If you don't know what's Our Singapore Reef, they are the people that organizes underwater beach, no, underwater plastic cleanup, yeah? The only one in Singapore that I've heard of. So, um, yeah, so thank you, everybody. Um, Kata, shall we have the gallery back again? Sure. Sure. Well, underwater beach cleaner. Tom, you gotta bring your skip there, man. <laughs> <laughs> right. So um shall we go back to the view where we can see all the panelists? Yeah, for for which slide, Nora? I mean is go it this? Am I view? gallery view? Uh, maybe you don't screenshot. She want to see our faces, oh, okay. our beautiful faces. Oh, I see. Uh, right. Okay. 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 <laughs> Nora, just say it as say it lah. Walau gallery, just say want to see all our beautiful faces. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so cheap. So cheap. This is the Singaporean. Uh, <laughs> humble. Humble lah. Humble. So uh, basically, yeah. Uh, uh, we would like to invite everybody to attend our World Ocean Week that will be happening on uh, World Ocean Day itself on uh, Monday, June 8th. Uh, we will have, INEX will be uh, uh, rolling out a week of programs um, that is um, happening on Monday, World Ocean Week. Tuesday will be Coral Triangle Day where we're going to just narrow down into corals and uh, Monday will be on blue green 101 where we're going to talk about ocean uh, solution sorry ocean innovative solution and also touch base a little bit on um, uh, ocean fundings um, yes Tom yes ocean funding yes they are looking at large scale but let's see what they can share with us a little bit more and on Thursday we're going to focus on ocean youth defender 
let's get all the we will be uh, sharing certain talks from um uh, youth all across uh, the world that they're going to talk about a plastic initiative and of course friday we are going to focus on education through um underwater photography and also in the light of uh, scuba diving itself. Uh, thank you, Kata. Let's go back to everybody's faces again. And uh, last, <laughs> last but not least, I'd like to say thank you to all of you. Um, I would like to say thank you to Tom from Seven Clean Seas. Uh, thank you to Matilda from Ocean Purpose Project. Uh, thank you from Marco from Tian San Shipping. And last but not least, the man with the moustache, I hope you grow even bigger, uh, <laughs> is Paul Foster from uh, All Clear. Uh, thank, you. thank you, everybody. See you soon. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks so much, Nora. Bye. Bye.